I am Quinton Collins, Assistant Director of the Cell University Solstice MFA and Creative Writing Program. Welcome again to our Summer 2023 Evening Reading Series, with today's edition featuring alum and graduate assistant Temple Lovely, faculty member Jose Angel Arabus, and guest faculty member Esther G. Bailey. This is the fourth in a series of seven events taking part of a series for this 10-day residency here in Auburndale, Massachusetts, and kicking off our fall 2023 semester. As we open this physical and virtual space, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which the Cell University stands is that of the Pawtucket and the Massachusetts people. The Cell's campus is a place to honor and respect the history of the native and indigenous communities who continue to reside in the area currently known as Massachusetts. And the continued efforts of their community leaders to ensure that history is not oversimplified or lost. This statement is one small step and acknowledging the difficult history that brought us to reside on this land and to help us seek understanding of our place within that history. Ownership of land itself is a colonial concept, and we acknowledge that the ideal restorative measure is to return land to Native and Indigenous communities. The Solstice MFA program pledges to seek out Native writers for our faculty and guest faculty, and meanwhile, we have established the Buse Fellowship for Native and Indigenous Writers, which will be granted to an incoming Solstice student annually hope to inspire others to take action as well, one way you might do so is to consider a gift to the Native Land Conservancy based in the area currently known as Mashpee, Massachusetts. More information is available in the chat for those of you on the live stream and can be found at nativelandconservancy.org. And now for tonight's events. First up, we will have Temple, who will be introduced by a fellow alum and graduate assistant, Noah Shea. Then we will have Jose, who will be introduced by certificate student and alum, Lindsay Applegar. And then we will conclude with Esther, who will be introduced by our founding director, Ben Carney. And welcome to the mic, Noah. Hi, everyone. Excuse me. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here and welcome to this evening's reading. Tonight, it is my honor to introduce my fellow grad assistant, Temple Lovely, as a first reader. While I've not known Temple for long, I met him for the first time at the beginning or at the end of last week. And in this short time, it's already become clear to me that they possess a strong, kind personality, as well as a fantastic sense of humor. Temple is a transgender writer, an educator, a community organizer, and a self-professed gremlin of mischievous joy. <laughs> Temple's energy is infectious, and it is a ton of fun to just be around them. Temple graduated from the Solstice MFA program in 2018 and has a number of literary accomplishments to their name. He has been interviewed by Vice Magazine for the article Five People on Their Favorite Things About Being Non-Binary. They have a poetry featured in Bible Belt Queers Anthology. He has been Sundress Publications Poet and Pajamas Featured Reader and has served as a manuscript reader for Kevin Carey Press. His writing often explores ideas about gender, intergenerational trauma, disability, and cultural indoctrination, and their dark sense of humor is often present in these works. Currently, Temple is working on projects that focus on queer narratives for young adults and adults alike in prose, comics, and graphic novel forms. Temple is also quite accomplished outside the world of writing. When not engrossed in their own art, Temple poses as a figure model for art classes and works with radioactive cats. Ask him more about that after the reading. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Temple Lovely. This is homophobic instead of for a tall person. That was really nice, Noah, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'll tell everyone about the radio and cats. If I will talk about cats forever if you want me, but first I'll do some reading here. So I've been working on some uh, kind of creative nonfiction and poetry. Um, so it's a little bit of a hybrid thing I'll be reading today about uh, my family. 
So here's my first one. I think of my father. Would he wear a mask? Or would he, like when they began enforcing seatbelt laws, scoff, rub his gray stubbled chin, and scheme a way to jerry rig around caution? Like the seatbelt extender in his Navy Chevy truck, he would use it to trick the safety mechanism and disable the dashboard light and alarm. Would he get vaccinated? Or would he think it had mind control chips or AIDS in it, like the articles he searched for? hunched over in a permanently indented leather couch, Googling chemtrails and the border wall and dangerous trans people. Is he still feeding the ducks at Fulton Pond, ripping up the tiny pieces of saved stale bread we used to collect together, coughing, maskless? Does he still get his fishing license? Or have the misinstalled bolts in his left leg made even walking too hard after these 10 years of silence? I put my mask on and meet my patients. How to sterilize. I treated my wounds poorly, sealed them over with dirty fingers and band-aids too small or glue that won't stick or that gets stuck in ooze and hurts to peel away. My family taught me to close these wounds. Their fingers making mine dirty, fingers covered in nicks and scars and missing digits, smelling of grease, motor oil, spoiled milk, yeast, asbestos, bleach, mildewing newspaper. My grandmother on my father's side broke her back in a factory. She was told she would never walk again. She did. And raised two kids, her spine curved, a sideways S, with her head perched on her shoulders, like a bird in winter, its neck retracted into the feathers for warmth. She had her husband taken from her by another factory. I never met him. Cancer expanded, crushing the soft walls of his intestines, filling him thick like molasses with chemicals that invaded him. My grandmother on my mother's side was a person split into multiples. Identities splitting her selfhood, one person alone could not hold her visions of gnomes and fairies and beatings. She collected porcelain dolls. They always listened to her, she said unlike her immaculately conceived children. Her husband and her family left her to manage pills and appointments and psych wards and three children. They didn't mean to dirty our fingers. I know. They could barely clean their own. I don't want to say we are afflicted. We've heard that enough. Then blame for the voices we hear yelling at us and breaks in our bones that we did not have choice in. And there are people to blame but they run on unbroken legs and backs and brains like we did not help them, like we will not need their help and they will not need ours. I am not afflicted and these wounds need washing. I get needles in my skin, blood taken, blood given, anesthesia, fluids, ink, drawings. I scar my skin and pay others to do so. Tattoos now teach me that open wounds need air how to wash and how to clean them, how to check hands if they are clean enough to help, how to let wounds drain and when to ask for help. I will raise no children. New features. Other people see their parents' features. You have your father's early grand hair. You have your mother's nose crinkle. You have his bellowing, shaking laugh and feel at home. Can trace the carbon bonds and the threads of DNA that shape their bodies, sprouting, rooting, growing through time and feel at home, feel they are reflected. My mirrored features only serve as nightmares, fears on my skin. They serve a history I must remember, but a skin I desperately want to shed. The hint of having humor and inheritance from my father does not bring me solace. What if, like him, my goofy faces, silly mannerisms, and dramatic voices are swimming in transphobic slurs and racist caricatures? What if my childhood penchant for roughhousing with my uncles with boiling stomachs, smoldering, smoldering tense shoulders, and witty jabs turns into the violent fights of their adulthood? I need to build more than the porcelain mushroom houses my mom made, abandoned with the rest of her art, for false homes and falser men. I smear cream on my thighs, filled with chemicals and hormones, 
small hairs root, grow, sprout, spreading across my thighs? Will these fibers be enough to grow a different type of home? My belly swells, my arms thicken, my voice creaks and stutters, my mirrored features shudder and shift. I spread out more cream. Fill my holes. It's the dark humor coming in. Um, jab, inject, jab, inject, jab, inject. Feel something other than blood leaking into your veins, a prickle or a burn on the skin, sometimes just the cold sensation, like the condensation from your cup of iced coffee somehow slipped into your veins. Jab, inject, jab, inject, jab, inject, cut open. Be it ink, hormones, medications, anesthesia, you are filled with openings. Strangers' hands inside your chest cavity, your belly scooping you out like some sort of fucked up meat ice cream. You wonder if you if it looks like the raw food you feed your cat. Jab, inject, cut, jab, inject, cut, open and open and open. Search, stab, cut again, cut again. Strangers' hands open you. You know their names, what they do, and not much else. You know more about your tattoo artist than the person who guided the microscopic camera, a mechanical visioning snake through an incision right below your belly button. Jab, inject, jab, cut open, cut, cut, suture, mend, close, bandage. You can still feel the knitted lines of the dissolving thread and needle over your chest. Sewn with precision and bandaged by nameless hands. Raised and ropey are the scars. Their suture glue got caught in your stomach hair and took two weeks to come out. Now only a small bump remains below your belly button. You get a piercing right above. Today, I sat shirtless in the sun. Six months after they removed six pounds of breast tissue from my open chest, over 500. The sun warmed my neck, my fingers running over puffed hard scar tissue, poking and pausing where I could feel the fibrous fingers of nerves reconnecting to meet my own, over 500. Six months and some skin still gives no reaction, no reach back, no hairs raising, or surprise to build a blight up my chest, or dull pressure points, or dramatic needles of sensation. These senseless parts of me, I motion, massage with a gentle hand and the side of a soup spoon. My massage therapist taught me how to use it. Covered in lotion, the side of the spoon glides over my skin until it meets the resistance of toughened tissue or dissolving stitches. Memories of my open body being emptied by precise surgical hands. Then I work harder, applying more pressure, pushing slightly deeper, hoping to help my body untangle, further dissolve my memories. Over 500. This summer, I will feel the sun like this. No bathing suit tops, sun discoloring my scars, touching new parts of me that have never been touched before. Over 500. 2023 and over 500 anti-trans and LGBTQ laws have been proposed in the US, more than 2021 and 2022 combined. I was just afraid for you. I didn't want you to be hurt. My mother's words. I pressed the spoon deeper. You tried to erase my existence in hopes of something easier. My words. The spoon hits a tense rope in the middle of my chest. My neck and shoulders ripple. Breath is hard to remember. I push, but it does not budge. It is too hard. I put the spoon down. Clouds crowd the Seattle sky. They cover the sun for a moment, dampening the glass prisms that speckled my Barbie paint room. Thank you. Jose Anelardos, PhD. Is the author most recently of Agoda, Black Lawrence Press, 2022. His poetry and prose have appeared in Prairie Schooner, 
Poetry International, the Oxen Hills Review, and Oxidon Ingen, among other places. He is an assistant professor at Suffolk University, where he serves as editor in chief of Solomon, and is also a faculty member of the Solstice Low Residency MFA program. He blogs and reviews books at the Friday Influence. His debut lyric memoir, Ruin and Want, is forthcoming from Sundress Publications. Also forthcoming is La Esperanza Espera, a collection of poems in Spanish published by Valparaiso Ediciones. Jose Anel Arabus, Mi Maestro, appreciates my voice even when I don't pronounce his books right. <laughs> Praising my efforts and my struggles. He cares that I care about what the sea is trying to tell me through the waves of images, white space, blind breaks, typos. He has committed and surrendered with me way down into the whirlpool. Literally, my poetry book is in the shape of a whirlpool. And he has struggled with me back up and out toward the light for gasps of peace that are never long enough. Yet his response was, yeah. That's nice. I like that. But send me the rest of it. So I sent him all 60 pages and he read it. Jose doesn't teach, he facilitates. In a feedback letter, he wrote, quote, we can't in English pass over the richness of seeing art in artifice, nor ignoring the author behind the authority in a text. To be present as an authority behind a text isn't to be despotic or nor controlling but rather to honor a writer's role in the literary role, end quote. So please welcome and honor the presence behind the text of Jose Ana Anubis. Thank you to Lindsay. Thank you to Temple. That, that was yes. Um, and thank you for everyone being here. Whatever you've uh, survived to get here in your lives and the rain, I saw it. Uh, I'm so glad you're here. Um, okay, I'm gonna read from uh, Rotura, but before I do that, I'm gonna read the poem that I've been I've heard this a couple of times, and I I wrote it. It's, it's an occasional poem, which is um, like poets occasionally write poems, but. Um, <laughs> I got invited to um, read at the Grolier Poetry Bookshop, which is like the big fancy in Harvard workshop. And of course, the first thing I do is uh, try to make a pun about the the books, the, the name Grolier. So in the poem I'm going to read, I really I I had wanted to write a poem that was that was funny. And I I whenever I that happens and I intend that I write something like this. Um, <laughs> so you're going to hear the the phrase grow excuse me Grolier than now. Um, that's the pun I wanted to make. So let's enjoy that now. Let's laugh. Uh, uh, let's see. Let's see what I actually wrote. So this is on Latinx, Latine, and other news of late, February 9th, 2023. Republicans acting all holier than thou are trying to control the language. They say Latinx should be banned in Arkansas and Connecticut. At least on government form, where control of language is on their terms. And it's not just Arkansas and Connecticut, Argentina and Spain have made moves to ban Latinx because they want Spanish only on their terms. None of this is just. Taking words and identity out of the hands of people are moves to ban people who only want to create a space for themselves. In the US, Republicans see words like identity as out of hand and pursue a thinly disguised anti-woke agenda. They would have this land only for themselves in the U.S. to their chosen history, their censorious sensibility. What of the self who awakens to another gender? What of the Latinx whose own cultures, racism and homophobia have them erased from history? What sensible recourse but to forge who we are from what we have? Without Latinx, all that's left is a culture of racism and homophobia. Politicians hunger for our votes, the Latino vote, and support, and think their only recourse is to try to change who we are, what we have. This isn't about us, ultimately. This is about political anger. Well, you can't afford a language. 
think pieces and folds are fluid, like language. And our language isn't about you. And to Spain and Argentina, what about Latinx? See? Ban one word, another crosses the border. The seed of self pulled further, fluent. With luck and anguish, we languish in our river languages from the Charles to the Rio Grande. Latine, the word proves rain language rails against all borders. Even where I write, is it Boston? Is it Malden? Is it Auburndale? Is it Newton, New England? I have rivered languages from the mystic to the Rio Bravo and have west and a la madre while wading through insults in Boston, Malden, and New England, this republic acts all holier than now without reckoning with what is holy. Pues, a la madre. The difference between holier than thou and worldlier than now means nothing when words are being banned. And all I can do is break form, break lines, break, break, break. Really appreciate it. Thank you to everyone in our virtual world. Um, uh, my partner is watching, so hi, baby. Uh, <laughs> um, so, a nice segue is I ended that poem on the word break, and um, Rafuda, the title of my um, latest collection, is uh, the Spanish word for break. And um, I'm gonna, I took, I'm taking an idea from, uh, I guess it was like, these are the poems that I don't read regularly. The book's been out for about a year, and I'm just like, you know, I love all the poems, um, so I want to make sure to uh, share them all. So uh, this first one that, I, that I'm going to read, you, you all don't want to say B sides because it makes it seem like it's not as good as the A side. We love the B side. These are the deep cuts, all right? <laughs> These aren't the scenes. There it is. I got it. Okay. Um, so for this uh, first poem, it's a sequence, and um, it's based on a painting. So it's, a, it's an ephrastic poem. Um, and um, in this painting, it's just titled Saudade. And uh, the visual I want y'all to have, I'm going to stand over here. Uh, <laughs> and so that's the pose you got to have in your mind. And in the painting, a woman is standing there. Um, I can't remember the age of the, the century from this painting, but it's a woman standing there with a black shawl kind of around her. Um, and intensely looking at this letter, right? And I, 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 my first reaction to this was like, oh, that's how we hold our phones, right? That's how, that's how we do that. And like the fact that this person is in this painting forever in that pose, like you want to know what are those words to be reading? What is, what is going on there? Um, so anyway, I ran with that. And the, the painting is by Jose Teraz de Almeida uh, through New York. And, um, the painting is called Saltaje, which is a Portuguese word that is um, untranslatable. So the closest we can get to it, I believe, is a longing, yearning for place. Uh, so this is Saltaje. My wife catches me with the painting on my computer screen, and I say, it's Saltaje, as if the woman engrossed in her letter leaning against the open window were named after this feeling of longing for something absent, a place a person one loves. I set saudade as the wallpaper on my computer, and whenever I write in my journal, poetry, daily life, tarot cards, I close everything so that saudade alone is there, busy with her words, clutching her black shawl to her mouth, each breath caught there. This is how we stand with cell phones. I say this one afternoon without warning, without a conversation between us, without even meaning to. I retrace my thinking while my wife remembers the painting with me. Woman reading in another life, a portrait of being without. Is this the face I made when I stood reading my wife's text, telling about eight people being shot in our neighborhood within 24 hours as I waited to board a plane back to her, believing and not believing, the words pulsing with each breath? Is this the face she made waiting for me to call while at Capitol? Right after the mass shooting a week earlier, pulse in the air as a poet sang pulso, 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 until the room I sat in pulsed with attention, with presence and life. Is this the face my friend made as he sat in the same audience, the poet's words taking him elsewhere? Other faces, he told me later, it meant the world to have an elder poet speak to the younger generation in solidarity, meaning 
we spoke of listening. Is this the face I would see reflected between photos and clips of Aleppo, scenes of rubble and ruins that push me back into myself until there is no self, just silence, a finger swiping a screen, and eyes that cannot see clearly fast enough? Saudade, I am dark haired like you, as tied to words in silence as you. As I go gray, do I grow less or more like you? The more I write, the more I am left to rewrite. Saudade, words change the more we read them. The photo of the poet Raul Zurita standing in the water one must walk through to read the sea of pain has been looking elsewhere. Saudade, his work is an installation, a work of presence. Instead of just liking it, I should be doing something too. Googling Saudade, I find a video where one man says, you can't translate it. Another one says, you can't touch it. Saudade, in your painting, your eyes are half closed, the words near memorized, the paper presence only. You leave me with the distance implied in a word from a professor. You're looking at survival where there aren't standards. You want wisdom, but accept sonority as substitute. You might find an editor for readership. You might not. A white ear schooled in white lit will consider this torque towards melodrama. Unique, not enough. Or, or a severe in writing residency. So, my, my poets, if you're playing at home, the, the bingo, you've heard at least one pantoum now, <laughs> one lyric, one poem in one syllabics. I know you're counting my soul, right? Uh, this poem, um, again, in, in the spirit of our writing residency, um, this poem I wrote originally in 2006 and didn't get to the a, a finalized version until um, two years ago. So, he got it with these poems, <laughs> right? <laughs> they will make sense. They will, they will and they will stay with you. Um, this is one of three poems in a series um, taking on the idea of conditioning and the multiple meanings. Uh, this one is conditioning, air study. Conditioning is what is done with soldiers, the heads of children and dogs. What is studied in the swipe and tap of our fingers across screens. Conditioning is your legs red at noon, the concrete of a city blurred by the same fever falling in sheets of sweat down your back your head ringing, swimming in life. Conditioning is the hubris of weather by button, the shift of felt buckle mentality of, it don't matter even the holes in the sky or the waste in the water, we can fix this fight, this sun's mad knuckle. Your Thea hates it when you lock the fan while she watches TV. Anytime you do, a sandal shoots past your head and smacks the glass like a fish clock on concrete. The sad sound of being out of place. You are used to it. You are used to sunflower seed shell pop with your teeth, counting down each salty second. Used to the shells collecting in the trash like the black and white wings of some creature that has to be gnashed at for the summer to pass. Walking down the hall and feeling cold seep through the cracks of other people's places. Activate thoughts of faces working outside when the sun scolds skin raw, forgets how to hold back. Thoughts of another life where you walk down streets until your shoelaces were bit away to the knot. And nights where you held a small fold of dollars like aces, allowing you to sit a little longer, hold a coffee in a diner a little longer when it got too bad outside. Thoughts of how it's always bad, even when it's not your hand anymore or your back, just your impoverished pride walking beside you, feeling the cold like a voice rising in another room, shutting you down to a whisper in the margins of someone else's argument. Down the aisle of a bus with a broken AC, a boy follows his mother, his whole body shoved forward by the clamber and shove of a stop. His open palm hits his mother's waist. She swats it, switches her cell phone to the ear closest to him. Without looking up, the boy tries again. His fingers are in the air that would hold him, and they spread and let through light.
Um, being a writer is a funny thing. It's, it's at times funny, at other times it's like that first ball. But um, one of the things that I, I, I've recently done is a couple of times in this book where I, I, go, I try to look at Google Maps for the places of my childhood. Um, my family and I were from Matamoros, Mexico. And uh, but early on, my mom moved us to Corpus Christi, Texas. And so that's where I grew up. That's what you'll hear a lot about in this book is Corpus Christi. Um, and uh, yeah, like, like it's one thing to kind of like grow up and like write about things and then be like, oh yeah, like my grandpa, he grew up, you know, um, in a cardboard shack in a, like next to a landfill in, in Mexico, like, you know, like like the images you see of bodies, I feel like that gets more pressed than Um, but it's competing now, uh, unfortunately. Um, but um, what I'm getting at is I, I look at Google Maps for like where my aunt used to live, like her ranch in Matamoros and all that. And it's like, I look at Matamoros, I remember the first time I saw it, I, was, I could see all the buildings, all the things that had names and were marked. And I was like, well, that's not it. That's not where my aunt lived. And I, I followed the country road. And um, basically my aunt lives somewhere that's not marked on the map. Um, and, and yeah, like, that's where my family comes from. So, and that's why this poem probably starts in a dream. So this is called, oh, and the, the neighborhoods are called colonias. I'm in Matamoros. So in La Colonia, I cannot find. I dream in a house filled with winter, a house always between stages. My tia in the country where I am a child watches as her dream house develops. Walls of cardboard and wood planks make way for cinder blocks. Doors to each room go from bed sheets to knobbed solid doors. The floor remains dirt long past childhood, past when I stayed there. Long into the stories I hear a deal made with Narcos to keep safe the house I used to dream in. Her house different each year I slept there. Memories now different colors. The bottoms of my feet, the color of the earth, I walk across feeling winter. Each small step picking up more of the earth. My Thea faces wanting more for herself, each step as dark as mine. In dreams, we talk in the same house I try to place years later on a map of Matamoros. Not the crowded colonias near the bridges, nor the populated street lined the center, nor the blocked off industrial zone. My eye veers further down dark swaths of map, unmarked and undeveloped. One road straight into the open fields and ranches of makeshift shacks and shacks shifting, made into the country we find ourselves dreaming in now. We counsel each other in Spanish and English, say we did not know, no sabíamos, what the country would be like, nor what would happen there. We walk amidst changing walls, our steps marking the path and the path marking our soul, the earth molding to where I relive nights of winter, of not knowing, this is the nature of longing, of faith, of not being satisfied. Did, did, I, did I bring my poems? No. Uh, I've got page numbers on here. Usually I have to look at text. Anyway, here's another poem in the conditioning series. This one's called Run and Study. I must run, walking won't get me there. Miles must take the place of arms, distance, embrace. I must run until I become air. Conditioning is a whisper on the eyelash of an eye that doesn't blink, afraid of missing seconds past. Conditioning is the day spent thinking, a bee working his wings to slivers, a life never done with communicating. I had to run with my Mexico and Ginsburg tucked under my whiskers, run and sew asterisks and metaphors where buttons had fallen off shirts. I must run because all I thirst for are syllables. And when someone says to me, no that is mierda or latine, what's that? I go, keep score. I must run because footprints don't last long in the sand and the desert is larger than people can hurt. There, there are days when the sun is a moon I can't understand. 
conditioning is words spoken, unaware, they like cars live broken in need of constant repair. Conditioning is being told to drink only white milk so that your skin might change. This from someone whose skin matches yours, down to the shame. I must run or else I'll always be taking off my path in nice neighborhoods, always smoothing down my hair, always trying to look acceptable, but feeling off. Um, I want to end on something, something happy. I, I think happy. Um, I mean, we, we like blackberries, right? Like they're, they're tasty. Um, so I'm gonna, yeah, uh, what's the Spanish word? Uh, Saxamona. I love I have my buddy, uh, Chente, uh, Vincent Cooper, if he's watching, what's up, homie? Um, what's it called? He's got his, his first book came out a couple years ago, and it's called Saxamona. And I'm just like, that's, yeah, such a great word. Um, and I think the last thing I'll say, I, I actually have a favorite word in this poem. Um, <laughs> uh, it's the word styles. Um, I don't know, like when you're writing, like you're just like trying to do research about like, well, I'm, I found myself writing about this. What can I, what, what else is in conversation with this? And I found out that the little pelitos, the little like hairs and fur on a, on a blackberry, those are called styles. I'm like, how amazing is that? Like that, even, even my, 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 um, or uh, summary of my research. Um, it's probably a better poem than this. Just that's just like the, the speculation around style. I'm like, that's that's nice. So, um, that's what got me writing this poem. So this is called "In the Margins with Blackberries." I feel dirty eating them, plucking them off the fence along the cemetery after work. No one else comes to eat them. Before I bite down. I let each berry linger on my tongue, the styles prickling, reaching out from the flesh. Who can help what the body remembers? What bristle and burn? What colors? Not the seasons, not the birds that follow, not the leaves finding themselves flickering and falling. I walk past graves of people I have never known and think of friends I have, of how I have never walked past their graves, of who might be doing so now. Rubbing my darkened fingers against my jeans, no one's around, but I hurry anyway. Why let them dry up, burst? Let their sweetness linger on my fingers. Let them ask for my attention a few more hours. Thank you. Wow. Hello, everyone. Esther G. Bellin is author of two books of poetry, From the Belly of My Beauty and of Cartography. She is also author of The Diné Reader, an anthology of Navajo literature. A two-time recipient of the American Book Award from the Before Columbus Foundation, Esther is a graduate of the Institute of American Indian Arts and the University of California, Berkeley, as well as Antioch University in Los Angeles. Esther is a citizen of the Navajo Nation and lives on the Colorado side of the Four Corners area of America's Southwest. She teaches in the Native American and Indigenous Studies Department at Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado, as well as the Low Residency MFA in Creative Writing Program at Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Esther was raised in the Los Angeles area, where she learned to transplant and strengthen her Diné worldview with the help of her parents, and the resilient Indian community that remains there. Her writing and multimedia art reflect that worldview of her Navajo people and the historical trauma rising from the US government policies, most especially the federally run 
Indian re relocation policy that ran from 1869 to the 1960s and put myriad Native children, including her parents, in boarding schools with a mission of cultural genocide. Diné in Navajo, if I understand correctly, means the people. In a 2000 interview for studies in American Indian literature, Esther stressed the connection between writing and our oral tradition. She said, I see myself as an interpreter of what happened in my parents' generation. And I want to let people know about their experiences, especially with boarding schools and relocation. I see my books as an anthropological, anthropological text telling what it's like for Native people. In a review in library journal, states that Bellum provides graphic descriptions of the wounds one endures remaining true to a native lifestyle. In her work, words chant themselves onto the page, calling to ancient beliefs and truths, while at the same time looking at today's maelstrom of cultural, spiritual, and physical dissonance, sometimes expressed through words, and sometimes through typographic and linguistic illustrations, as well as the Diné cardinal points. Hers is truly a voice and a point of view that is unique to many of us and has so much to teach. I had the true pleasure of meeting Esther a few years ago in Colorado, as we share a mutual friend there. As we had lunch at a picnic table and chatted, about poetry and work and life, I felt an immediate connection to her and then was entranced by her poems. Diné poet Lucy Tapahanzo has voiced the hope. May we remember that holiness exists in the ordinary elements of our lives. In her poems, Esther Bellum reminds us again and again of that holiness. And we are inspired and enlightened by their extraordinary vision and light. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you. It's fun to hear. I'm going to start off uh, reading from uh, the beginning of, of the tribe. My tongue is a fire. Today I am the water. Yesterday I was wood. I give my body to the flames. I give my body to the energy that makes me struggle. I give my body to the tune where the wind of the Holy Spirit blows in my face. If yesterday I was wood, I place my tongue onto the kitchen table near the butcher block of knives. If today I am water, my tongue is over the hard goods and bodily imprints attached to the mountains to be restored. I begin this poem with the end in mind. To be restored, I begin this poem with a stone knife in hand. To be restored, I begin this poem with fire. Thinning into female mist, the spiral from my skull is tangled in the moon's belly. A zigzag attachment, a breathing entity, coal fired thoughts deepening widening. Another moon approaches like buffalo grass seed germination, thwarted, intact under layers, like Navajo culture, like primitive chants, like a 12-step ladder. One, lightness. Navajos are much more than prayer. Cut the tops off the letters of my words. Two, 
air, spaces, people fighting us, prayer full of, I used to, I used to use Wi-Fi to connect. Three, dry land and separation, arroyos and more than the spirit world, methodology. I cut a window into the walls with my prayers. The blood spills across the page. A speaker stand and a microphone hollow out the air like a cracking can of pop. The first gulp of Navajos rotating like warehoused collections flattened on a screen, breathing in and in and never out. Distortion propelled as Promethean and people sit quietly in awe of the strip teams. The digital transfers deluge the darkness, a marked deck of images displayed and people sit quietly, stirred silently from the stripper's blank stare and they vaguely remember clapping their hands. That's the um, the beginning, and I, I I refer to it as the sort of the pre-conscious um, part of the book before it opens. And this book of cartography really does um, use the cardinal points and the the Navajo direction system. So we are cardinal, I guess, north is east. So we're just like kind of a little bit back. From, from how we normally see maps. And um, there's a poem that's sort of a, a visual poem that begins the series. And it's, uh, it's uh, it says, nas bas, nas bas, nas bas, nas bas. And it's more of a spatial poem. And so it's, it's like the germinating and um, the kind of awakening. So that all, there's a series, there's probably like a series of seven poems. And those were some of them that start, um, that are kind of like the pre, the germinating, the pre-conscious. And I'll use one last poem out of the book, but I want to read some other pieces too. So this next, um, piece I'm reading accompanied an art piece, and I didn't think about it till later, but I'll, I'll go ahead and read. It was a collaboration with Andre Leandre. On February 23, 2020, two white men in a pickup truck fatally shot on an artery on an unarmed 25-year-old black man jogging in a Georgia neighborhood. Everything was quiet except the gun, fire signaling another sun dead. Oh, bloody Sunday, dreaded morning run, news feed seared red, quickly shrouding more dead. The more dead, the quicker the erasure from the eyes and the heart seizes, trembles, searches the wounded, a pulse, a slight purr, everything quiet, piercing prayers humble, everything quiet, piercing prayers humble. From your story, I filtered the sudden. My apologies to you that I just started today. I could and could not filter the illusion of justice, your absence like a fallen cottonwood tree, its shade no longer filtering, sizzling summer heat is the discomfort, the unsettling loss I now feel. From your story, I hit the hard mineral bottom, knocked myself unconscious, awoke covered with viral laden organisms of hatred. I could and could not bear the pressure 
protruding like a pulsing vein of campaign slogans, a hornet's nest of venom, pounding spike after spike, brittle bones cracking, split open, life-giving marrow sucked dry. Once again, the storyteller tells, while we were all sleeping, our enemy planted weeds in our garden and left. Let this not be our heritage. Let this not be our rage. Let this not be our lineage. Let this not be our end. On this day, we mark the ground with no more blood, shed no more suns, sifted out, no more shackling of the human spirit. On this day, we release the noose, tightening the boundary lines, cinching the names from being heard, filtering out the sediment. The ecology of hatred looks like this. The air is saturated in tear gas. Our tear ducts combust with ignited rage and grief. The soil is fertile with sinkholes. The boundary lines amputate. The limbless shuffle and slide, shuffle and slide with caution. The water does not quench the devouring thirst. We are still, still tired of being orderly, waiting in line, cup in extended hand. From time to time, from time to time, revisionists harrow and hoe, hand select day old vegetation, uproot, transplant resuscitate neatly, thralls of demarcated remnants, educators, harrow and hoe, hand select childhood dreams, legislators, harrow and hoe, hand select shades of the color wheel, mothers, harrow and hoe, hand select fallowed lullabies. Whoa to the obstinate masses who trust in misguided proverbs, the multitudes who discount the human spirit to target practice. Woe to the babblers ensnared in ill-founded truths, their harvest a field of wrath and gloom. Woe to the curtailers who manipulate measure lines of justice who ravage the wells of righteousness. They received no mercy. On February 23, 2020, two white men in a pickup truck fatally shot Ahmed Arzu, an unarmed 25-year-old black man jogging in a Georgia neighborhood. The pandemic, I and I'm sure many of you follow the news. Um, just connecting with other artists and um, finding ways to uh, manage a lot of um, the chaos um, and find comfort in each other. And in that beautiful poem and the art that accompany um, it came out of that creation, or came out of that time. Uh, this next piece is um, one that I uh, wrote recently. So I just finished a group show with eight other artists, and it was a really interesting project. It was about Buffalo Soldiers and their uh, kind of intersection in Southwest Colorado. 
there is a fort, uh, Fort Garland, that was instrumental in so many different ways, um, part of the Civil War, um, part of Indian Wars. It's just south of one of the Navajo Boundary Mountains. So, it, and it's in the borderland. Um, so, it, it's right on the border between New Mexico and Colorado. So, for people who are um, the descendants of, of land grant communities um, from the Treaty of um, Guadalupe Hidalgo. Um, and it's, it's just a convergence of communities. And we really work the a group two um, regiments of Buffalo soldiers were in that area for about eight years. And you know, so this was post-Civil War. They were actively recruited um, and kind of guaranteed freedom, <laughs> which Emancipation Proclamation had already guaranteed that freedom, um, but more sort of in practice, um, guaranteed education if um, they, they joined these troops. And, and this is uh, part, this was, this poem was part of that exhibit. So it was, um, I wrote a, a sequence, but this is one of them. Oh, this decree is to be enforced by all the nation. The power of tis duty of every government conscription to thereof protect its citizens. This is our golden moment. Join in the fight, battles guaranteed to light liberty on this soil of our birth and shackles. Those of African descent proceed immediately to Fort Garland. Colonial sabers slaughtering indigenous brethren, hostiles under the same flag. From this day forward, the rules governing Buffalo soldiers, Anglo expansionism, enslaving, shackling down, a reconstruction era dog fight, dog collar hold, pegged down deep. Oh, this decree is to be enforced by all the nation. The power of those of African descent proceed immediately to Fort Garland, guaranteed to light liberty on this soil of our birth and shackles, a reconstruction era dog fight, dog collar hold, peg down deep, colonial sabers slaughtering indigenous brethren, hostiles, tis duty of every government conscription to thereof protect under the same flag. From this day forward, the rules governing its citizens. This is our golden moment. Join in the fight, battles against division of land and spirit, birthright and shackles. In today's talk, I was talking uh, a bit about uh, re-territorialization of language and thought, and this, this next poem came out of it. Revolt of the Territorialized Tongue, one. I have been reading the reports, the long hand riveted ripples penned from officers of the US military, institution of colonial domain, tamping down indigenous bloodshed, tissue, bone, and ornament as meal, as fertilizer to creator-given soil. I have been reading the reports with my peripheral brain. My cognitive creative brain is much too precious, too much on this side of recovery this side of sunset protected from the asphalt seamed in asphyxiated stories. I have been reading the reports wearing my helmet of salvation pulled tightly around my crown, calling upon the monster slayers to slash the syllables from my tongue to gut the colonial syntax 
bring the savage poetics of the Nefazad back to the shoreline of my vocabulary, oxygenating my lifeblood. Reports I have been rearranging like outdated dioramas, plastering over exposed flesh, moistening the dehydrated voices, pruning the colonized contorted roots, unsettling the placid, punctuated phrases with surgical pincers, reordering the syllabics, hand-stitching the mangled lining of my tongue. I have been grammaring myself into the syntactical remembrance, digging up myself from the colonized redaction. Two, more commonly known as the US Colorado New Mexico state border, the 37th degree Northern parallel boundary becomes the line dividing the two union states and is approximately 334 miles long. Colorado was admitted to the Union on August 1, 1876, becoming the 38th state. New Mexico was admitted to the Union on January 6, 1912, becoming the 47th state. The Union has yet to admit blood guiltiness. The division created from state lines and the settler occupation of this region does not extinguish indigenous territory. The fraudulent principles of the doctrine of discovery sifts the chafe from the genocidal threshing, grates humanity into the ink and in racial inspired computations, congressional, military insertions, slight negations, fractionated semantics, crossing blood, crossing land, stolen, pioneered, pierced, prodded, punctuated, pummeled, excavated, extracted, then eliminated with boundary lines. Three, the contents map loss, blank and blank, blank and blank, blank and blank, Machine guns, groanings, tumble out, letters, adjust the volume on the decibel while filling in the blanks more and more, less multiples of choice. The letter K funnels last year's fits of rage into the lowercase i, cries layers of skin, injects the addictive su substances, the L dams things up, wedges into sharp corners and hooks and loops limbs. The second letter L repeats the action with more velocity. The empty blank spaces are not a loss. The empty is reloading the long barrel hunting rifle and I let it fill me up and shape me. Four. May this legislative war, its prescriptive two times a day, syringe administered granular syntax, and its offspring to seize. Coal rouged cheeks, uranium sooted eyelids, viral pink painted lips, kidnapper of women overgrazing on our syllabic iotas, perfunctory poison, it's doing. A poison is a poison is a poison is truth leaving everything behind. A poison is a poison is a poison is a substance with many aliases, contorting tongue and territory, a false face Historically used schematics scratching away the surface, indigenous origins legislatively prescribed. A poison is a command to play my heart for the king. May the war and its offsprings 
please. Um, this afternoon, I, um, I, I gave an introduction um, in Navajo and I described uh, my plans. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my plans now. So we inherit our, our plans from our mother. We're a natural animal society. And so my first plan is um, an adopted plan. And it's, uh, so for, so there is, for the Navajo people, we have four original plans. And then we have other created plans, um, just that's how things really occur. Um, so a lot of my work, especially around the Buffalo Soldier Project, um, it, kind of dives into borderless or borderland boundary kind of politics. And at that time, at the same time those things were occurring at that port, um, was the same time that the Navajo people were rounded up and sent to a prison camp. And we were there for four years and then released. And during the march is a, a physical march walking about 300 miles, um, there were many stories of um, Navajo women and children being stolen and so sold on, on the slave market. And so while slavery for um, African Americans had, um, you know, sort of been, been free at that time, uh, slavery of indigenous people was still going on. And, and so, those kind of stories were happening. And, and then a lot of, uh, I mean, interesting wars and communities and partnerships were happening not only with the Spanish, with the Indian Pueblos, with Navajos, Apaches, Utes, uh, all the different tribes in the Southwest. And so my particular tribe, which is our clan, which is my mom's, is an adopted clan because one of the, um, the chief headmen, him and his wife used to travel to Santa Fe quite a bit to um, do a lot of negotiating of land and, and treaty rights. Um, and they used to stop. And so generally how, when they travel, they always brought things with them to trade and barter with. And um, the, the woman, her name was Juanita, she uh, was known as a rug weaver and she would trade with this particular Indian Pueblo village and they uh, adopted her in there. And so that's her. So my first plan is actually the Zia Pueblo. So her original plan, we don't really know, but she was adopted in and so she started a new clan. And so the Navajo people are like that. We have, we have like the Mexican clan, we have the Ute clan, the famous Pueblo clan. Uh, and, and so we, have always been, and I think a lot of tribes have, have done that. Rather than sort of exclude, we've always had um, people adopted in um, to our clan. Um, my husband's um, first clan was uh, started by uh, a Spanish, uh, two young girls that were orphaned, um, Spanish sisters. And, and so they brought them in. And, and so it's really interesting, like when you, start sharing your clan and your history, it really links you um, to other, other people in the area. Um, it rarely sort of divides you. And, and so that's, I explained that earlier about um, the clans and the clan system. So that's my first plan. My second plan I get from my father, and he's an original clan. He's part of our origin story, which is a water clan. Um, and then, my third clan is my mother's father, which is um, the Red House clan, which is like a, kind of like Adobe Bricks. And then the third or fourth is my dad's father, which is um, Tachi, which is, um, I don't know how to translate that one, but that, that's the fourth one. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and end with this poem called Into the 
My little sister's boyfriend is a real Hollywood movie. He even plays one in the Steven Spielberg miniseries, Into the West, Journey to the Heart of the American Dream. So I said, does that mean you're now an Indian princess by association? She doesn't laugh, but hands me a DVD set of the miniseries. We sit under a gazebo at the sushi house in West LA. I swallow the last mouthful of green tea and take the gift. The bitter tailings of the tea intrigue me to ask what kind of role her boyfriend Victor plays. I can easily see Victor bare chested, sitting upon a stallion, screaming out a war cry. His long, thick hair neatly woven into braids, resting on his honey colored chest. A stripe of red chi across his cheekbone, maybe some on his horse. What Hollywood does not tell us is that this war cry is not a declaration to war, but a recurring nightmarish cry of waking up to the silence that sits heavy upon the heart like a ghost, walking a mountain footpath full of pine cones and having each one a bloodline that no longer runs through veins. Victor plays a very important role. He has a speaking part. I say, wow, they actually let him talk while he's scalping a helpless homesteader. I see her slow grin surface and she says, just watch it. He has a much bigger role than the one he had in smoke signals. Later, I watch disc one with my husband. We eat popcorn and wince at the narrator whose skin is pale like goose flesh, telling a Photoshop version of how our land was stolen. The narrator is Hollywood also, trying to be objective about the style in which Congress passed the Indian Removal Act of 1830 the Trail of Tears in 1838, the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851. The narrator reveals thin attempts to resolve his conscious later in the episode for assisting a runaway slave and marrying a widowed Lakota woman he rescued from the auction block. I start to fold into the crisp scenery and romantic view of our idealistic beginning. Most people can't, but I can always spot the warrior, the chief, or holy man crawling from the depths of Indian Alley, crawling from the animated screen back into a makeshift dwelling on downtown streets. Cultural preservationists keeping vigilant watch over their bundles. As the sun sets on the first layer in this journey, the narrator's creamy voiceover blows the visionary history of Hollywood into my hair. We have a wheel that goes from here to there. They have a wheel that goes to the stars. Thank you. Thank you again to Temple. Glenn. And to Ashley. 